It's Paul here with a short script that illustrates some of the ideas that are incorporated into the proofs for week three. Uh, let's start out with a binomial distribution in the well-known baseball context. So suppose we have a 300 hitter. For those of you who are not baseball aficionados, that means someone who gets a hit three-tenths of a time on going to the bat. So we can do this very straightforwardly by creating a vector with three repetitions of hit and seven repetitions of out. You can see that down below. And if we sample from that with replacement, we can simulate a season where the player goes to the bat 500 times and store those samples in a vector x. Now if we ask for the mean value of x equals hit. Remember that equals 1 if x is hit, 0 if it's out. You get the percentage of hits, the batting average, 0.292. Wait, wait, you said. This was a 300 hitter, and here he's hitting 292. Well, that's what happens when you sample. We can do the same thing over again. This time he was a 310 hitter. And this time he was a 272 hitter. Most baseball fans would say, oh, if someone hits 272 after having been a 300 hitter for his career, he's fading. He's in a slump. Something is wrong. But now you see, even with 500 trips to the plate, that can happen um, quite frequently. Here's an easier way to do the same thing. We use the R binome function. Remember, that generates random R for random samples from a binomial distribution gets 500 samples and the probability is uh, 0.3 of success and the 1 means 500 samples of 1. So there's our x and when we take its mean it's 318, 284, 324. This is working the same way. Now, let's look at the mean and variance of the sampling distribution. This is one of the few times in this course that we actually have to use a loop. I said you're only expected to be software users, not programmers, but we'll use this little for loop. And what I'm going to do is set up a numeric vector named hits that has 10 to the fourth empty slots in it. And then for I taking all values from 1 through n inclusive, I will calculate the sum of uh, 500 samples of 1 from a binomial distribution with a probability of success 0 0.3. That's a Bernoulli distribution. And store it in the ith slot. So now I've got a vector with 10,000 outcomes. I can make a histogram. I find that breaks equals FD generally gives a nicer looking histogram than the default. And notice I set frequency equal to false. That means vertically it displays a probability density function. If I take the mean of this vector, I get something very close to 150. And if I take the mean of the square, I get something very close to the population variance. So there we used the binomial distribution with one trial, the Bernoulli distribution. But the built-in binomial distribution has the exact probability density function. Since I want to overlay this probability density on the existing histogram, I use a low-level plotting function called points. That's why I don't have to say add equals true. And what am I plotting? First argument, horizontally, I'm plotting 0 through 500. Second argument, vertically, I'm plotting the probability density function for the binomial distribution. I'm plotting it in red. And type equals h, which I discovered experimentally, makes something that looks quite a bit like a histogram. Notice it will only plot between 120 and 180, because that's what's on the existing graph. And when I overlay 
this density function on the histogram, you see the two things match up quite nicely. Now we can simulate 10,000 seasons. All I have to do is generate a random sample from a binomial distribution with uh, 500 trials probability of success equal to 0 0.3. And having done that n times, remember capital N is 10,000, I can display the histogram. Bingo, there it is. Bingo, there's the overlay. Nice example of a sampling distribution. From the samples, I can try to estimate the expectation and variance of a binomial random variable. My estimate of the expectation from the samples is 149.9. The actual expectation, of course, is 150. And the variance, which we calculated in one of the proofs, was 105. And when I estimate the population variance from the samples, remember I'm going to divide by n minus 1 instead of n in doing that, I get something that's very close. Alternatively, I can get the expectation and variance straight from the dbinom function. All I have to do is take the probability of each value between 0 and 500, multiply the probability by that value, and I get exactly 150. If, on the other hand, I square the numbers 0 through 500, and then subtract off the square of the expectation, I get exactly the population variance, which is 105. Now let's look at the interesting issue of what happens when you square samples from a normal distribution. So I will get 10,000 samples from a normal distribution. There's the first six, just to look at them. If I take the mean of these samples, not surprisingly, I get something that's very close to 0. And if I get the sample variance, I get something that is fairly close to 1. Let's instead try squaring all these samples. R does this quite happily. You ask to square a vector. It squares every uh, component of that vector. So we now have 10,000 normal squared samples. And if you plot a histogram of this, you see it has very, very high values for uh, small values of the argument. The reason is that when you square a small number, you get an even smaller number. But this is supposedly a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. So let's overlay the probability density function for that. d chi-squared, d for density, and 1 means one degree of freedom. And it really does match up quite nicely, doesn't it? When I ask for the mean of this, I'm doing exactly the same calculation that I did for sample variance. So I'm not surprised to get something very close to 1. Now let's try the same thing, but starting with a binomial distribution. And this, in effect, is your introduction to the central limit theorem, though I'm not using that name for it this time. So. We'll have 10,000 trials, a probability of success of 1 fourth. So we expect to get 1,000 successes on the average. And so I call our binome 4,000 samples. Sorry. I call our binome where I have 10 to the fourth elements in the sampling vector. And each one comes from a binomial distribution with 4,000 trials, probability of success 1 fourth. And there's just a few of them. You can see they flutter around 1,000, as you'd expect. And there's the histogram. And it does look kind of bell curvish, doesn't it? That's what the central limit theorem is eventually going to prove for us. Not surprisingly, however, the peak is at 1,000. We'll subtract off that expected value of 1,000 to get BSAMP2. And now when we plot that, it's centered on 0. That looks like a normal distribution, but certainly not a normal distribution 
with a variance of 1. No problem. We know what the variance is. Theoretically, for a binomial distribution, it should be NP times 1 minus P. And sure enough, the two things come out fairly close together. So if I take this vector of binomial samples and divide by the square root of the variance, I now have something where the variance should be 1. And when I plot the histogram, it's now looking more and more like a standard normal distribution. If I overlay a graph of the density function for the normal distribution, you can see what a good match we get. Now let's try squaring everything. If we square samples from a normal distribution, they are supposed to have a chi-squared distribution. There's a histogram of what I get when I square the samples and plot them. I will overlay the density function for chi-squared, and the two things match up fairly well. Having looked at this, you might want to go back and have another peek at the proofs just to see what it is that was being illustrated in this script. I am done.